Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Ostara. We'll be back there. Um, Jamie's in the other room. Today we are going to finish up, well I'm not going to finish the whole book obviously, but we're going to finish up reading book four in the Rue Plumet <coughs> and, the, and the syrup section is called St. Dennis and I love the Rue Plumet. Let me turn on my, on my fan again in a moment. We are on to book four, Aid from Below or From Above. It's a pretty short book, so we'll probably get into the sub uh, into the summaries of books one to four. So subcategory one, wound outside, cheer within. Thus their life gradually grew darker. Only one distraction was left to them, and this had formerly been a pleasure. To take bread to those who were hungry and clothing, to those who were cold. In these visits to the poor in which Cosette often accompanied John Bell John, they found some remnant of their former lightheartedness. And sometimes when they had had a good day, when a good great deal of distress had been relieved and many little children received <clears throat> and made warm in the evening, Cosette was a bit cheerful. It was during this time that they visited the John Dretts. A day after that visit, John Bell John appeared in the house in the morning with his ordinary calm, but with a large wound on his left arm, very much inflamed and infected, which looked like a burn, which he explained away. This wound kept him indoors for more than a month with a fever. <clears throat> he would not see a doctor. When Cosette urged it, he replied, call for the veterinarian. <coughs> but <coughs> Cosette dressed it night and morning with such grace and angelic pleasure, and being useful to him that Jean Valjean felt all his happiness return. His fears and his anxieties dissipate, and he looked at Cosette, saying, Oh, the good wound. Oh, this kind injury. Seeing that her father was sick, Cosette had deserted the little house and renewed her interest in the little lodge in the backyard. She spent almost all her time with John Bell John and read to him from the books he liked, in general travel books. John Bell John was coming alive again. His happiness revived with inexpressible radiance, the Luxembourg. The unknown young prowler, Cosette's coldness, all these clouds over his soul faded away. He now said to himself, I imagined all that. I'm an old fool. His happiness was so great that the horrible discovery that the Nardias made in the Jondrette den and so unexpectedly had in some sort of coasted over him. He had managed to escape. His trace was lost. What did he care about the rest? He thought of it only to grieve over those wretches. They are now in prison and can do no more harm, he thought. Pitiful family. As to the hideous vision <coughs> of the barrier du Maine, Cosette never mentioned again, it again. At the convent, Sister St. Mechtilde had taught Cosette music. Cosette had the voice of a soulful songbird, and sometimes in the evening, in the humble lodging of the wounded man, she sang plaintive songs that cheered John Bell John. Spring came. The garden was so wonderful at that season that John Bell John said to Cosette, You never go there. I wish you would walk in it. As you like, father, she said, said Cosette. And out of obedience to her father, she went back to her walks in the garden, usually alone, for as we have noted, John Bell John, who probably dreaded being seen through the gate, hardly ever went there. John Bell John's wound had been a diversion. When Cosette saw that her father was suffering less, and that he was getting well, and that he seemed ha happy, she felt the contentment that she did not even notice. So gently and naturally did it come. <clears throat> it was then March. The days were growing longer. Winter was leaving. Winter always carries with it something of our sadness. Then April came, that daybreak of summer, fresh as every dawn, gay as every childhood, weeping a little sometimes, like the infinite it is. Nature in this month has charming glimmers that pass from the sky, the sky, the clouds, the trees, the fields, and the flowers into the heart of man. Cosette was still too young for this April joy, which resembled her, not to find its way to her heart, unconsciously, without any suspicion on her part. The darkness passed away from her mind. In the spring it grows light in sad souls, and as, as at noon in its, it is light in cellars, and Cosette was, now very sad, was not very sad now. That is the way things stood, but she did not notice it. In the morning about ten after breakfast, 
when she had managed to entice her father into the garden for a quarter of an hour, and while she was walking in the sun in front of the steps, supporting his wounded arm. She did not notice that she was constantly laughing and that she was happy. Overjoyed, John Valjean saw her become fresh and rosy again. Oh, the blessed wound, he repeated in a whisper, and he was and he was grateful to the Thenardiers. As soon as his wound had healed, he resumed his solitary twilight walks. It would be a mistake to believe that one can walk in this way alone in the uninhabited regions of Paris and not of Paris and not meet with some adventure. Subcategory two Mother Plutarch is not embarrassed by the explanation of a phenomenon. One evening, little Gavroche had, no, had had no dinner. He remembered that he had <clears throat> had no dinner the day before either. This was becoming tiresome. He tried. He decided to try for some supper. He was wandering beyond La Salpetriere in the deserted spots. Those are the places for good luck. Where there's nobody, something can be found. He came to a settlement that seemed to him to be the village of Austerlitz. In one of his preceding strolls, he had noticed an old garden there haunted by an old man and an old woman. And in this garden, a passable apple tree. Beside the apple tree, there was a sort of fruit shed, poorly enclosed where an apple might be acquired. An apple is a supper. An apple is life. What ruined Adam might save Gavroche. The garden, the garden was on a lonely lane, unpaved and bordered with bushes for lack of houses. A hedge separated it from the lane. Gavroche headed for the garden. He found the lane. He recognized the apple tree. He verified the fruit shed. He examined the hedge. A hedge is one stride. The sun was sinking, not a cat in the lane. The time was good. Gavroche prepared for his entry. Then suddenly stopped. Somebody was talking in the garden. Gavroche looked through one of the openings in the hedge. Within two steps of him at the foot of the hedge on the other side, precisely at the point where the hole he was eyeing would have taken taken him, lay a stone which made it kind of seat, on, and on this seat the old man of the garden was sitting with the old woman standing in front of him. The old woman was grumbling. Gavroche, who was anything but discreet, listened. Mon Dieu, mes beauf, mes beauf, said the old woman. Mes beauf, thought Gavroche, that's an odd name. The old woman who addressed did not budge. The old woman repeated, Mon Dieu, mes beauf, without raising his eyes from the ground. The old man decided to answer, What, Mother Plutarch? Mother Plutarch, thought Gavroche, another odd name. Mother Plutarch resumed, and the old man was forced to enter into the conversation. The landlord is dissatisfied. Why so? Three quarters do. In three months there will be four. He says he will turn you out in the street. I shall go. The grocery woman wants to be paid. She's holding under her firewood. What will you use to keep her warm this winter? We won't have any wood. There's the sun. The butcher is refusing credit. He won't give us any more meat. That's all right. I don't digest meat well. It is too heavy. What will we have for dinner? Bread. The baker is demanding something on account and says no money, no bread. Very well. What will you eat? We have apples from the apple tree. But, mon Dieu, we can't just live like that without money. I don't have any. The old woman went away. The old man stayed alone. He began to reflect. Gavroche was reflecting on his side. It was almost dark. The first result of Gavroche's reflection was that instead of climbing over the edge, he crept under. The branches separated a little at the bottom of the, of the bushes. Hi-ho, exclaimed Gavroche internally. An alcove, and he hid in it. He was almost touching Father Mabeuf's seat. He heard the octogenarian breathe. That for dinner, he tried to sleep. Then for dinner, he tried to sleep. Sleep of a cat, sleep with one eye. Even while dozing off, Gavroche kept watch. The white of the twilight sky blanched the earth, and the light made a livid line between the two rows of dusky bushes. Suddenly, two dim forms appeared in that whitened band. One came in the lead, the other some distance behind. There are two interlopers, growled Gavroche. The first form seemed old bourgeois, bent and thoughtful, dressed more than simply, walking with the slow pace of an aged man and taking his ease in the starry evening. The second was straight, f firm, and slight. It regulated its step from by the step of the first, but in the unusual slowness of the gait, dexterity and agility were evident. In addition to something wild and startling, this form had the total appearance of what then 
called a, what was then called a dandy. The hat was of the latest style. The coat was black, well cut, probably of fine cloth, and closely fitted at the waist. The head was up with a robust held up. Head was held up with a robust grace, and under the hat could be seen in the twilight the pale profile of a young man. His profile had a rose <coughs> in his mouth. The second form was familiar to Gavroche. It was Montparnasse. As to the other, he could have said nothing about it, except that it was some old man. Gavroche immediately applied himself to observation. One of these two clearly had designs on the other. Gavroche was well situated to see the outcome. The alcove had very conveniently become a hiding place. Mount <clears throat> Montparnasse was on the parallel at such an hour in such a place. It was threatening. Gavroche felt this gamin's heart moved with pity for the old man. What could he do? Intervene? One weakness in aid of another? That would be ludicrous to Montparnasse. Gavroche could not avoid the fact that to this formidable bandit of eighteen, First the old man, then the child will be simply two mouthfuls. While Gavroche was deliberating, the attack was made, sharp and hideous. The attack of a tiger and a wild ass, a spider on a fly, without notice. Montparnasse threw away the rose, sprang on the old man, collared him, grasped him, and hung on. And Gavroche could hardly restrain his cry. A moment later, one of these men was under the other. Exhausted, panting, struggling with a knee of marble on his breast. Only it was not altogether as Gavroche had expected. The one on the ground was Montparnasse. The one above was the older man. Good for him. All this happened a few steps away from Gavroche. The old man had taken the blow and returned it, and returned it so terribly. In the twinkling of an eye, the assailant and assailed had risen, uh, changed roles. There was a brave veteran, thought Gavroche, and he could not help clapping his hands. But the applause was lost. It did not reach the two combatants, absorbed and deafened by each other, and mingling their breath in the struggle. There was silence. Montparnasse stopped struggling. Gavroche said under his breath, Can he be dead? The man had not spoken a word nor uttered a cry. He got to his feet, and Gavroche heard him say to Montparnasse, Get up. <coughs> Montparnasse got up, but the old man held but the man held on to him. Montparnasse held the humiliated had the humiliated and furious attitude of wolf caught by a sheep. Gavroche looked and listened, trying to back up his eyes with his ears. He was having a marvelous time. He was rewarded for his conscientious concern as a spectator. He was able to seize on the wing the following dialogue, which took on a strangely tragic tone from the darkness. The old man questioned. Montparnasse replied, How old are you, nineteen? You are strong and healthy. Why don't you work? It's boring. What is your business, loafer? Talk seriously. Can I do anything for you? What would you like to be? A thief? There was a silence. The old man seemed deeply pensive. He was motionless, yet did not release Montparnasse. From time to time, the young bandit, bandit vigorous and nimble, made the efforts of a beast caught in a snare. He gave a shake, attempted a trip, twisted his limbs, desperately tried to escape. The old man did not appear to notice. With a single hand held his two arms, with a sovereign indifference of absolute strength. The old man's reverie continued for some time. Then, looking steadily at Montparnasse, he gently raised his voice and spoke to him. In that darkness where they were, a sort of solemn allocution, which Gavroche did not lose a syllable. My child, through laziness, you are entering into the most laborious of existences. Ah, you declare yourself a loafer. Prepare to labor. Have you seen a terrible machine called the rolling mill? Beware of it. Beware of it. It is a clever... Fierce thing. If it catches you coat your coattail, you're entirely drawn in. This machine is idleness. Stop while there's still time and save yourself. Otherwise, it is all over. You'll soon be between the gears. Once caught, give up for hope for anything more. Or on to fatigue, idler. No more rest. The implacable iron hand of labor seized you. Earn a living. Have a task. Accomplish a duty. You don't want that? To be like others is tiresome? Well, then, you'll be different. Work is the law. Whoever spurns it as a tiresome will have it as punishment. You are unwilling to be a working man. You will be a slave. Work releases you on the one hand, only to take you on the other. You are unwilling to be its friend. You will be its slave. Ah, you refuse the honest 
weariness of men, you'll have the sweat of the damned. While others sing, you'll rave. You will see from far away, from below, other men at work. It will seem to you that they are at rest. The laborer, the reaper, the sailor, the blacksmith will appear to you in the, to you in the light like the blessed in some paradise. What a radiance in the anvil to drive the plow, to bind the sheep is happiness. The bark running free from before the wind, what a f festival. You idler, dig, draw, roll, march, drag your halter. You're a beast of burden in hell's train. Ah, to do nothing, that's your aim. Well, not a week, not a day, not an hour. Without crushing exhaustion, you won't be able to lift a thing except with anguish. Every minute that elapses will make your muscles crack. What will be a feather for others will be a rock for you. The simplest thing will become sheep, steep. Life will become a monster around you. Coming, going, breathing, so many terrible labors. Your lungs will feel like a hundred pound weight. To go here rather than there will become a problem to solve. Any other man who wants to go, how it opens his door, it's done, he's out of doors. You, if you wish to go out, have, a, have to pierce your wall. To go out in the street, what does everybody do? Everybody goes down the staircase, but you, you'll tear up, to your, be up your bed clothes. You'll make a rope of them, strip by strip. Then you'll go through your window, and you'll hang on that thread over an abyss. And it will be at night, in a storm, in the rain, in a hurricane. And if the rope is too short, you'll have one way left to go down, to fall. As fall as a chance would have it. Into the abyss, from whatever height, unto what? Unto whatever it is, whatever it is below. To the unknown, or you'll climb through the <coughs> chimney flue, at the risk of burning yourself. Or you'll crawl through a sewer, at the risk of being drowned. I'm not talking about the holes you have to conceal, the stones you must take out and put back 20 times a day. The mortar you have to hide in your mattress, a lock shows up in his pocket. The bourgeois has his key, made by a locksmith. You, if you want to go out, you are condemned to make a frightful masterpiece. You'll take a big sou. You'll cut it into two slices. With what tools, you'll invent them. That's your business. Then you'll hollow out the interior of these two slices, preserving the outside carefully. And all around the edge, you'll cut a screw thread so they'll fit closely together, like a bottom and a cover. The bottom and the top screw together that way. Nobody will suspect anything. To the watchman, for you will be watched. It will be a big suit to you. It will be a big, it will be a box. What will you put in this box? A little bit of steel, a watch spring, and what? in which you'll cut teeth, which will be a saw, which this saw as long as a pin, and hidden in this sou, you'll have to cut the bolt of the lock, the slide of the bolt, the clasp of the padlock, and the bar at your window, and the iron ring in you'll have on your leg, that you'll have on your leg. With this masterpiece finished, this prodigy accomplished, all those miracles of art, the cunning of skill, of patience executed, If it comes to be known that you are the author, that will be what will be your reward? The dungeon. There is your fortune, future. Idleness, pleasure. What pits? To do nothing is a dreary course to take. Do do you know that? To live idle on the substance of the society, to be useless—that is to say, noxious—that leads straight to the lowest depths of misery. Woe to anyone who aspires to be a parasite. He'll be vermin. Ah, you don't enjoy working. Ah, you will have. One thought only to eat and drink and sleep in luxury. You'll drink water, you'll eat black bread, you'll sleep on a board with irons riveted to your limbs. Whose chill you'll feel that night against your flesh. You'll break those irons, you'll run off. Fine. He's got a point there. Anybody who's able bodied should, you know, work and not expect everybody to <coughs> do it for them. Because there has to be work to do. You'll drag yourself on your belly and... If you, okay, you'll feel at night against... Where am I? You'll sleep on a board with iron riveted to your limbs, whose chill you'll feel at night against your flesh. You'll break those irons. You'll run off. Fine. You'll drag yourself on your belly in the bushes and eat grass like the beasts of the forest. You'll be picked up again, and then you'll spend years in a dungeon, fastened to a wall, groping for a drink from your pitcher. Gnawing a frightful loaf of bread, that uh, bre loaf of darkness that the dogs wouldn't touch, eating beans the worms have eaten before you. You'll be a good louse. You'll be a wood louse in a cellar. Oh, take pity on yourself, miserable child. 
young thing, a suckling not 20 years ago, who undoubtedly has a mother still alive. I beg you, listen to me. You want fine black clothes, shining pumps to curl your hair, put sweet scented oil on your locks, to please you a woman to be handsome, you'll be close shaven <coughs> with a red tunic and wooden shoes. You want a ring on your finger, you, you'll have an iron collar on your neck. And if you look at a woman, a blow with a club, and you'll go in there at 20, and you'll come out at 50. You'll enter young, rosy, fresh, with your eyes bright and all your teeth white, and your beautiful, youthful hair. You'll come out broken, bent, wrinkled, toothless, horrible, with white hair. Oh, my poor child, you're taking the wrong road. Laziness is giving you bad advice. Hardy... The hardest of all labor is robbery. Trust me, don't undertake this dreadful drudgery of being an idler. Becoming a rascal isn't practical. It's not so hard to be an honest man. Go now and think of what I've said to you. And now, what did you want from me? My purse? Here it is. And the old man, releasing Montparnasse, put his purse in his hand, which Montparnasse weighed for a moment, after which, with the same automatic precaution as if he had stolen it. Montparnasse let it glide gently in the back pocket of his coat. All this said and done, the good man turned his back, quietly resumed his walk. Blockhead, murmured Montparnasse. Who was this man? The reader has doubtless guessed. John Bell John. Montparnasse, dazed, watched him till he disappeared in the twilight. This contemplation was fatal to him. While the old man was moving away, Gavroche was approaching. With a side glance, Gavroche made sure that Father Mayboff Perhaps the sleep was still sitting on the sea. Then the urchin came out of his bushes and began to creep along in the shade behind the motionless Montparnasse. He reached Montparnasse without being seen or heard, gently slipped and slipping his hand into the back pocket of the fine black cloth coat, took the purse, withdrew his hand, and creeping off again, slid away like an adder into the darkness. Montparnasse, who had no reason to be on his guard and was reflecting for the first time in his life, noticed nothing. When he had reached the point where Father Mabeuf was, Gavroche threw the purse over the hedge and fled at full speed. The purse fell on Father Mabeuf's feet. This shock woke him up. He stooped down and picked up the purse. He did not understand it at all, and he opened it. The purse was two compartments. In one, there were some small coins. In the other, there were six Napoleons. M. Mabeuf, extremely startled, carried the thing to his housekeeper. It fell from heaven, said Mother Plutarch. That's the end of book four. And let me get, I'm going to get into the summary and um, this last four is analysis of books one to four. One moment. Okay. It's a summary of Les Mis's Les summary analysis of part four. The Idol in the Rue Plumet and the Epic of the Rue Saint Denis, chapters one to four, books one to four. Chapters on a few pages of history. This chapter is dedicated to a historical interlude and a meditation on the political situation in France in the early 19th century. In particular, the chapter describes the significance of the July monarchy, which was established by the Revolution of 1830. The French Revolution, beginning in 1789, opened a power vacuum that was eventually filled by Napoleon, who established the French Empire. After Napoleon's fall at Waterloo, Two kings from the House of Bourbon, a minor offshoot of the French royal family, took control of France and reigned from 1814 to 1830. These kings, Louis XVIII and Charles X, presided over a rare time of peace in France. However, they were very slow to grant their social freedoms that were so hard won during the French Revolution. And the nation of France rebelled and deposed the king. Victor Hugo sees this as a victory of the people. However, the Second Revolution was frustrated by monarchists who believed that the only chance for peace lay in the restoration of the monarchy. Louis Philippe from the House of Orleans, another minor branch of the, royal, of the French royal family, was placed on the throne. Louis Philippe is said to embody the spirit of the age. Despite his royal blood, he is sympathetic to liberal ideas and democracy. He conducts himself with a restraint and does a number of things to endear himself to the people, such as pardoning political prisoners. However, Louis Felipe finds that he is too liberal for the conservative who wants restoration. 
of the rights they had before the French Revolution and unpalatable to the Republicans who abhor the idea of a monarchy. A third party is slowly emerging. Socialist thinkers and Democrats opposed to the concept of monarchy, inequality, and rule by the pro property classes are growing in strength. There are many such groups distinguished by small differentiations in their ideology, but all of them champion the power of the people. In the spring of 1832 in the St. Antoine district, the working class part of Paris, violent revolutionary ideas smolder. Fourth of July. Children are found playing with bullet cast casings, and one can hear snatches of conversation about violent uprisings. This is the A Base Society, still led by Enjolras, is one of the players in this coming uprising. Enjolras and his companions uh, frantically make connections with the with other groups of revolutionary students. And workers. Even Grantaire, the doubter and cynic, is caught up in the excitement. He tells Enjolras that he can declaim as well as, as any revolutionary and persuades Enjolras to send him to send him to organize a group of workers. Unfortunately, Enjolras later sees Grantaire playing dice with these workers rather than inspiring them to revolution. Chapter 2 or Book 2, Epinine. After the incident with the Thenardier family, Marius moves out of the Gorbeau tenement. He does not want to live in such a sequel, in such a squalid, excuse me, place any longer, but neither does he want to testify against the Nardier. He does not think much, he does not think much for about the incident, but except to puzzle out the strange behavior of his beloved fathers who did not cry out for help when he was making attack, being attacked. Marius pines, okay, of his beloved, okay, father did not cry off, okay, he was wondering why that John Bell John didn't, okay, Marius pines for his lost beloved, he has no energy to work, he only writes snatches of true love letters and poetry, he wanders the streets of Paris looking for the blonde girl he fell in love with, but he cannot find her anywhere, meanwhile the patron Manette gang continue their criminal careers, Montparnasse and Plaskesis slipped away from the police. On the night of the arrest, Brujon and Babette write letters directing criminal activity from inside the walls of the prison. The help of Epinine, who was released from prison because of her young age, in the course of delivering one of these messages, Epinine discovers Cassette's whereabouts. Another character, Monjur Mabuff, the old church warden, has fallen on extremely hard times. He often eats only an egg a day, and he and has been forced to sell a number of his precious books. One day he tries to get up to water his flowers, but he is so weak from hunger that he cannot accomplish the task. His task, he sees a bizarre apparition, a ragged girl who wears, waters his, gar his entire garden while chatting incessantly. It is Zepnine. In return, she asks him only for Marius's address. A few days later, as Marius wanders the city dreaming from his lost beloved Cassette, Epinine appears and greets him with delight. She is deeply in love with him, but he is uninterested in her. Seeing this and wishing for his happiness, Epinine finally tells Cassette's, from Cassette's address. Delighted, Marius hands Epinine all the money he has in his pocket, but she lets it fall through her fingers, saying that she does not want his money. <laughs> Chapter 3 of Book 3, The House on the Rue Plumnet. Valjean has rented a little house in the suburb of St. Germain, which is distinguished by its secret exit, constructed by a judge who wished to visit his, his mistress. Why did they leave the safe haven of the Petit Picpus combat? Jean Valjean wanted Cosette to live a normal life, not one constrained by the rules of the convent. After the death of Fuck Eleven, Valjean told the nuns that he had inherited the small sum from his brother and departed the convent with Cassette. Actually, Valjean has rented the two apartments in Paris as a precaution. Cosette and a female servant named Toussaint live in one on the Rue Plumet. The two live simply but happily. The house has a small garden where Cosette spends much of her time. 
and she often goes with Valjean when he distributes alms to the poor. To the poor, excuse me. However, Cosette budding. Cosette's budding adolescence threatens this quiet life. She has grown beautiful and now dresses to flatter her body. Valjean knows that the time will come when she will leave him and get married. Cosette is the only person he has never has ever allowed himself to love. And the idea of loving losing her breaks his heart. Giving his fe his fear, Valjean is immediately suspicious when Cosette eyes Marius in the Luxembourg Gardens. Cosette falls in love with Marius immediately. Surreptitiously returning his glances, Valjean is immediately distrustful of the stranger, puts a halt to their walks in the garden. Cosette fall, uh, falls into a deep depression after she's separated from Marius, <coughs> which concerns Valjean even, even more, more. Even more, Cosette, Cosette raises the convent as no language to express the things that she's feeling. One day, when the two are walking, they see a mass of convicts being transported to the galleys. The men are dressed in rags, and they hurl obscenities at all those who watch them in their misery. Valjean is horrified at the vision from his part past, and the sense of Cosette is also deeply affected. Chapter 4, Book 4, like, I keep saying that, but... Help from below may be help from above. Not long after the terrifying spectacle of the convict transport, Valjean has his momentous visit with the Thenardiers. He says nothing of the incident to Cosette, but she is horrified at the appearance of the terrible burn on his arm. Her anxiety is increased when this wound becomes infected and causes a fever that combines Valjean <coughs> to his bed for a month. Cosette nurtures him with angelic devotion, and Valjean is heartened by his renewed closeness <coughs> with his adopted daughter. Cosette slowly forgets her love for Marius, and resumes her tight bond with her adopted father. The narrative brings us again into the life of Gavroche, the little street urchin who is also the abandoned son of the Thenardiers. Hungry after not eating for two days, he goes to the garden of M. Mabeuf to seek apples. He overhears an argument between, M. Ba between Mabeuf and his servant. They are discussing what to do now, that neither the baker nor the grocer will offer them any more food on credit. Gavroche ponders at this poverty, and that, that is even worse than his own. His reverie is endured by a commotion on the street. He sees an elderly gentleman being stalked by Montparnasse. A member of patron Manette, Montparnasse attacks the old man, but to Gavroche's amazement it is Montparnasse who is knocked to the crown and held in a vice grip. The elderly man then gives Montparnasse a lecture on the terrible life of a criminal. He will work harder than any worker, and his only reward will be social exclusion and imprisonment. The elderly man tries to persuade Montparnasse to renounce his criminal life <laughs> and finish by telling him to furnish this new life with donated money. The elderly man hands his purse to Montparnasse. Don't worry, it's not going to get you, honey. Then walks away. While Montparnasse is recovering from the bizarre, this bizarre situation, Gavroche plucks the purse from his pocket and tosses it into Monsieur Mabeuf's garden. Mabeuf is stunned by this fortune that has fallen from the sky. The Analysis Chapter 1 sets the political scene for a section of the book that is deeply shaped by politics. The French Revolution deposed the monarchy, but after the fall of, Mon of Napoleon, there was a movement to place of royal family back in power, albeit with limitations on their power. However, France also suffered from a variety of social problems, widespread poverty, unemployment, and so on. The populace was not thrilled at the return of the monarchy after such a concerted effort to overthrow them, and so we find ourselves in the situation of social unrest, of social unrest described in the book. Typical of sprawling humanistic narrative, Hugo switches from describing the national political situation to describing the love triangle between Marius, Cosette, and Eponine. This would ha seem contradictory, except for the fact that in the lives of individuals, love affairs can be as momentous as in a political uprising or change of government. Monsieur Maybough, the kind church warden who befriended George Pontmercy, George's Pontmercy, and Mar Marius is struggling. 
He's a prime example. He's a prime example of the undeserving poor. A good man who endure, endures terrible things. Don't worry, honey. Poor thing, she's afraid. Though he's a moral person, he still cannot make a living due to the terrible economy. How will Maybeth get by? Many of the characters suffer from lack of information. Mar Marius suffers from not knowing the location of Cosette. Valjean grieves due to his lack of information about Cosette's changed affections, and so on. Sudden revelations and cataclysmic events are the narrative solutions to such quandaries in the book. Despite chapter one, which focuses on the political scene of the time, none of the characters who feature prominently in these chapters have explicitly political meanings. Marius has abandoned those long ago after his expulsion from the A. Base society. Instead, Hugo uses their ordinary lives to illustrate the chaos of that time and place. Valjean is experiencing a new stage of life, but he is still haunted by his hidden past, which appears in the form of convict transport. Despite his retirement from the public eye and his quiet life ch of charity with his beloved Cosette, he will never be free from his past. And that's the end of the summary and analysis. And in the next video, we will get into book five, which is It End Unlike the Beginning. And subcategory one, Solitude in the Birth. But since it's the 4th of July, I have a great 4th of July and stay safe out there. Thank you. Almost Dara and poor Lily Delman. Good night.